Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. We'll give it a couple minutes to let everyone file in here. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started in just a minute. Um, thank you for being here this evening. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for the Wanderer and Alaska Wolf's final journey webcast. My name is Danielle Moser, and I'll be your MC for tonight. I'm the Wildlife Program Manager for Oregon Wild, and I'm honored to introduce our guest tonight. Tom Walker has been a rodeo hand, horse packer in the Sierra Nevadas, Alaska Wildlife Conservation Technician, pilot, wilderness guide, log home builder, and documentary film advisor. A photographer and writer, he is the author of more than a dozen books centered on Alaska, including Wild Shots, Alaska Wildlife, and the 70 Mile Kid. His work has been featured in Alaska Magazine, Field and Stream, Reader's Digest, Newsweek, Audubon, Sierra, and more. Living in Alaska for more than five decades, Walker resides in a log house near Denali National Park. Um, I would also like to take a moment to offer gratitude to the land itself tonight and for those who have lived here in Oregon since time immemorial. I would also like to acknowledge the continuing presence of indigenous peoples on the land today. The history of tribes in Oregon is complex and nuanced and includes colonial legacies and wrongdoings like forced removal that have long lasting and current impacts. It is important to not only acknowledge indigenous people and land, but continue to do meaningful work by supporting them in the present, respecting and uplifting tribal sovereignty and taking action. A recording of this program will be emailed out this week and will be posted on our website, OregonWild.org in the WILD blog. Please enter your questions at any time in the Q&A section um, of the webinar. We usually do get a flood of questions right at the end of the presentation. So the sooner you get yours in, the easier it is for me to organize those questions. Um, after, and then after Tom has presented, we will get into the Q&A. So um, thank you so much for, for joining us, Tom. And if you want to share your screen now. We can get started. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it very much. Uh, this particular story is very dear, near and dear to my heart because the one thing that's always fascinated me about animals is um, unique behaviors. And when I heard about this particular wolf's incredible movements, I knew that I had to tell the story. I'd always told people that I never wanted to write a wolf book because there's so much politics associated with the animal that it, the, the topic sometimes gets overburdened and overwhelmed by that. 
But I thought this was a unique opportunity to tell a story of an amazing animal, an amazing animal's journey. And the journey begins in Yukon Charlie Rivers National Park. You can see it on your screen here. Excuse me, Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve in Alaska. It's uh, northeast of Fairbanks uh, on the Yukon border, of Yukon Territory, north uh, east of Anchorage that you see here, which are the main cities in, in uh, interior in central Alaska. Um, Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve was established in 1980 as part of a National uh, Lands Reclassification Act and preserves an expansion of those refuges, parks and res refuges was not universally accepted in Alaska. They many people saw it as a big land grab and uh, there was some op quite a bit of opposition to it compared to the national uh, uh, approbation that uh, President Carter got for uh, establishing and expanding these parks, preserves, and refuges. When I first heard about the uh, amazing animal known as Wolf 258, I wanted to write about him. And when I got the original, he, he was, he was ca captured, given a, a satellite GPS radio collar, and uh, his movements have been tracked. And when I got the original data points, this is what I saw. I saw this overlay of Alaska with dates uh, here in his home territory. And then again, up here in the Arctic where he spent time, there were overlaying points and it was such a mishmash. I thought, how, how am I ever going to make sense this story because it just looks so complex, but like everything, you deconstruct it, start at the ground floor, and you get a better idea of where to begin. So once I had removed all of the, of the dates and settled on the points of movement, each of these red dots is a data point from one day to the next, and it gives the mileage the animal has moved in 24 hours. These data points, the caller gives off a signal that goes to a satellite. The satellite then transmits the information to a, a computer on the ground. And then that's downloaded to the, to the biologist studying the various animals. And of course, this was part of a larger study that had begun in 1996 in Yukon Charlie. And many animals were being tracked at the same time. And if you've ever walked with a free roaming dog, um, you know that like say from this point to this point on the GPS map measures 50 miles say, um, you know that if you've walked with a free roaming dog that they've gone twice as far or maybe even further uh, than that because this only measures point to point. And you know what, what canines are like, they're uh, to the left or the right, they're here, they're there, they're back again. So actually the distances could be much further than recorded between the points. So here was a simplified map that showed, uh, that the Park Service developed for me, that showed um, the, the wanderers, then known as Wolf 258, um, movements from uh, his capture in November of uh, 2010 until the end of his journey in October 2011. This is, his, this is Yukon Charlie uh, Rivers National Preserve, this area in gray. These are his movements within the preserve and then uh, he left um, Yukon Charlie on April 30th in 2011. A wolf has a specific set home territory, which they, as a pack, um, as part of a pack, they defend from other wolves. And these, these are the movements of wolf 258 within his home territory. 
This was the home territory of the Edwards Pack. Uh, the Edwards Pack had been as many as 11 animals at one time. And when Wolf 258 became a member of the pack, um, there was only one animal left in that pack. That was Wolf 227, a female who for over a year had somehow protected her territory, protected her territory and kept it from wolves that had packs in surrounding territories all around it. This drainage here you see here is the 70 mile drainage. And it's surmised that perhaps wolf 258, a male, uh, entered the adjoining area of wolf 227, the Edwards pack female, and joined her. So when Biologists had been following Wolf 227, who had been collared and saw that she'd taken up with a mate, a, a running mate, a running partner. They were really interested in trying to get a radio collar on that running partner because uh, they always try to have collars on the breeding pair in a pack so that they can keep better track of the pack and what's going on and see the productivity of that pack. A little background on Yukon Charlie, it goes from riverine uh, habitats to high alpine terrain, uh, alpine tundra is dominant in the hills. There's a production of uh, migratory birds, peregrine falcons, uh, upland game birds, and large mammals as well in the uh, lowlands along the rivers, in the thickets. Moose are common animal. They often have twins to, or maybe even three young. Caribou are a predominant animal in, the, in Yukon Charlie. And it's very important uh, country for one reason is because it contains the um, having grounds of the 40-mile of the, uh, caribou herd. This map shows you the summer calving area of uh, the 40-mile caribou herd, and it's right in the center of Yukon Charlie National Park or Preserve. And the, there's a lot of importance in um, the survival of calves in their summer and early spring range after their birth, of course. And this area had been uh, inhabited for quite a long time by uh, 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 natives, native Alaskans, the Han Guichin people. And then during the gold rush, uh, Eurasians uh, came into the country, um, mostly prospectors. This is the cabin of a trapper, uh, Phonograph Nelson was his name, uh, at the, near the mouth of the Nation River, which you'll hear about a little bit more uh, a little later on. And he, he had this trapping area probably from about 1910 to 1930, something like that. And he was found frozen to death in this cabin. Another historic landmark along the river is Slavin's Roadhouse. Roadhouses serve travelers using the Yukon as a highway. A lot of dog mushers, a lot of freighters, uh, mail carriers would stop in here for shelter. And the Yukon itself is a spectacular river, slow moving up, up in the central portions of its, of its uh, run to the uh, Bering Sea, and along these bluffs near Eagle and further downstream are the largest concentration of nesting peregrines in North America. This is a, a, on a big oxbow of the Yukon. It's a, the river here is about a mile or half mile wide. This is called Biederman Bluff. It's a thousand foot tall bluff in some areas that may be called a mountain, but you'll hear more about that in a minute too. And this is the mouth of the Kandik River. But summer in Yukon, along the Yukon, and like in all of Alaska, is very, very brief. 
uh, autumn comes in late August, and pretty soon the big river freezes up. It's interesting to note that for wolves, fall, late summer and fall is a very difficult time for them to find food. They've done fairly well in the spring and early summer on young animals, uh, the newborns, the migratory birds, even nests, and they've, they've done very, very well uh, preying on those species, but uh, late autumn, and very early winter, they they struggle to survive. Uh, it's it's pretty much the same for all predatory animals. Uh, I think I saw a statistic not long ago that about eighty percent of all red foxes born in the spring are dead by September. And it's just an example of how difficult a life a predator has in the wild making a living. For a lone wolf as you see here, attacking a large animal like a caribou or moose is fraught with danger. The, the, a moose can be 10 times as big as a wolf and, and is a formidable beast. And most wolves, lone wolves, won't approach a big bull except to see if it's uh, disadvantaged in some way. And that's where the power of the pack comes in because packs um, can attack these large uh, prey animals and do quite well feeding upon them, but and it it uh, influences the survival of pack members because together they can make a better living than they can alone. In Alaska, of course, there's an extreme controversy about the wolves because uh, of the human. Um, use of moose and caribou for meat. Some uh, native people still, still subsist in the old way, and a lot of urban people supplement their, their diet with moose and caribou meat. And lots of times when people aren't successful hunting, they blame wolves. Trapping and taking of wolves has a long, long history in Alaska. And almost from the very get-go when Euro Europeans came into the country, they, they, they influenced even the Aboriginal people in the trapping. Uh, they, would tr they would encourage them to go trapping, to uh, get furs, to trade for trade goods, trading posts and outposts. And consequently, a lot of the nomadic ways of Alaska Natives uh, changed and as they focused their, their, their efforts on trapping. Alaska also has a very long history of aerial wolf control. This is a, a photo from the 50s. You can see this pilot had, uh, this was an unusual arrangement, but he had four shotguns mounted on his wings, on his wings that he would shoot wolves from the air with. He had a, a switch in the in the cockpit cockpit that would allow him to dive on a on a wolf pack like a fighter bomber and shoot um, wolves. And these uh, are the guns in the Talkeetna uh, Historical Museum as they once were mounted on the plane. Uh, in in the other uh, wolf control effort focused on poisons. But when Alaska became a state in 1959, the very first thing the state did was outlaw the use of poisons, and they've never been employed since. And of course, uh, there's a lot of trapping of wolves to this day, both with leg hole traps and snares. And to get an idea of uh, how uh, wolves and big game animals interact in Yukon Charlie National Rivers Reserve. The um, uh, National Park Service started a wolf uh, following a tracking program in 1993, as I mentioned. They would track packs from the air and then using a dark gun loaded with uh, tranquilizing uh, drug called telazole, they would track and 
and um, anesthetized the moose to put on a radio collar. It's the third longest running wolf study in the United States. It's ongoing today. Biologist Matt Sorum is the current lead for that, that project. And although um, we call these uh, wolves gray wolves, they vary in color from black to white. Here's a research biologist, a research pilot, the biologist, with a wolf, a female wolf anesthetized up in the highlands of Yukon, Charlie. And a crew of biologists, Bridget Borg kneeling on the left, and John Birch, who was the lead biologist at the time on the right. And John Birch was the biologist who collared um, Wolf 258. When he collared Wolf 258, it was, un of course, it was uncollared when he first found it running with uh, the female 227. And he collared it. And uh, this was a this is what a typical collar looks like when a, when on a free running wolf. This is a wolf in Denali Park, but collar is pretty much the same. So so uh, something interesting happened sometime. Oh, I'm not quite. We are not quite sure what the date was, but in February of 2011. Uh, Wolf 227, the female um, of the last remaining female of the Edwards Pack, died up on the Nation River near Phonograph Nelson's cabin, not too far from there. She and 258 had been feeding on a, a moose that killed there earlier in the year, earlier in the winter, a couple, couple months earlier. And they'd gone back, probably looking for food. And John Birch believed that 258 or 227, excuse me, had probably died of starvation, whereas another biologist thinks she was likely killed by members of the Nation River Pack because this uh, kill of theirs happened to be in the area of the Nation River Pack. And packs are very, uh, protective of their territory and the prey within it. Dr. David Neese once said that uh, wolves either die one of two ways. They either die of starvation or they die of uh, being attacked and killed by other wolves. So 258, um, which I now nicknamed the Wanderer, started to, to travel through the territory all by himself. And he spent the next couple of months running around his old territory that it shared with 227. And then in the spring uh, of uh, April um, 2011, he left Yukon Charlie and started north. And what Biologists term an animal like this as a disperser. Wolves around three years of age leave their natal territory. Many of them leave their natal territory, both male and female, and go in search of territories and mates of their own. And if you think about that, um, they're going into ter terra incognito. They're going into a tabla rasa the uh, area they know nothing about. There is a uh, threat from people. There's a threat most definitely from other wolves. And, and you know, wolves have these incredible senses of smell, vision, hearing. And um, if you think about it, they, they gotta alter their behavior in some ways, and the use of their senses in some ways, because they just can't go out there and start howling and say, oh boy, baby, here I am. Um, I'm ready to meet somebody new. They couldn't do that. They, because by howling, 
they are announcing their presence. And if another pack that has that territory hears them, uh, they're putting themselves at great risk. So I believe uh, they must tone down the tendency to howl, which is one of their chief ways of communicating and connecting with other wolves. And they also must uh, not scent mark as much as they do when they're in their own uh, home territory. If you've ever walked a dog, you know that you come on a scent place or something that smells good and a dog has to add its its uh, its own um, smell to it. Well, again, this is sending out a message that I'm here, here I am, I'm a strange wolf. Wolves can have an incredible sense of smell. They get more information out of it than we'll ever know. And it would be very difficult for a dispersing wolf to go very far and continue to scent mark and howl like he would in his home territory or her home territory and not uh, put themselves at great risk from other wolves. And the whole point of this is for two unrelated wolves to come together, form a bond and eventually mate, uh, establish their own territory and pack. And consequently, the, the whole issue of how they come together is I don't I don't think it's ever been observed by anybody. Two lone dispersing wolves coming together, the mechanism of how they exactly find each other and approach each other and know there's uh, there's no risk in that connection is I think it's fairly mysterious still. I don't think anyone's ever seen that or observed that. So it's interesting as as uh, 258 left the Yukon River down here and started north. He went into the Yukon Territory and he was headed right near Fishing Branch Provincial Park in um, Yukon Territory, which is one of the most amazing places you could ever go. There's uh, uh, these underground fissures and limestone caves under the river and the water soaks down and percolates under the soil and stays warm. And then every uh, fall, very, very late, uh, a run of salmon spawns there and it attracts bears, it attracts wolves who come there to feed on salmon and he was headed right for that. But uh, for whatever reason, he turned away and continued on his journey. And uh, this is a fairly graphic picture. And it's just a reminder that he's going through groups of other established wolves. And that's a very dangerous thing for a wolf alone to, um, to enter the territory of other wolves that are at great risk of being killed. So he went all the way north. And it was an interesting year that year. The, the winter hung on in Alaska and in Yukon, just over the border, it was a little less wintry. And so the great porcupine caribou herd, which is around a hundred and something thousand animals at that time, were staying mostly in the Yukon territory. Normally they migrate north from their winter range down in the, in the southern part of, or central part of Alaska above Yukon Charlie, up to the Arctic refuge um, in Alaska along the Colleen River and Sheenjack River and the Firth River to the Arctic Slope. But this year, because the, the winter was so late, they stayed in the Yukon Territory and didn't go to their usual routes in. Alaska. The Firth River drainage usually looks like this in the spring. And this particular year, it was more open than Alaska. And so the caribou were beginning to, uh, to coalesce here in Yukon Territory along the Firth, whereas on the Alaska side of the border, it still looked like this. Caribou migrate in great 
uh, numbers, long distances from, from, from their winter range to their calving grounds on the north slope. And oftentimes they're hindered by weather. In this case, it was, it, the weather altered their movement from the south through Alaska, and it, it forced it more and over into the Yukon Territory. Deep snow hinders the migration as well. And finally, uh, you, the wanderer came all the way up through the Brooks Range into Alaska, but then veered over into Canada. And he got right, uh, this last point shows him within a mile or so of the Arctic Ocean. It's very conceivable that he was right on the edge of the Arctic Ocean at one point, the realm of the polar bear. Uh, you know, there are many wolves right on the north slope for reasons I'll get into later. And, and he um, probably got right to the edge of the Arctic Ocean. And then he turned southeast and went all the way to this point, the last recorded point, which is very close to the mouth of the Mackenzie River. And what was interesting was he'd gone counter to the movement of the caribou. The caribou would have been coming up this way, the, this direction, where they were gonna coalesce around here for their calving season. And he had gone through the herd, got down into a very risky place um, on Skull Ridge near the Mackenzie, and then had to backtrack back north. And so when he came into Alaska, he had already come through a group of, or many, many groups of wolves, dozens and dozens of wolves maybe, and maybe even hundreds of wolves in various packs and territories. In some way he had either been very lucky or very stealthy that he was able to avoid them. This is an, uh, a particularly amazing picture that an automated trail cam took in Avavik National Park where, where the, um, which was tra traversed by the wanderer of the interaction of two wolves with a grizzly bear. And this was the kind of thing that, we, of course, we have no record of it, but uh, Wolf 258, the wanderer, had to have run into other wolves and grizzly bears himself. Over in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, where he went after leaving Avavik, which is there on the coast, the north coast of the territory. Um, he entered the Arctic Refuge, as I said, and normally this is what he would encounter, groups of caribou coming from the south to have their calves on the coastal plain below the snows of Mount Michael. And in some years, huge herds of caribou form on the north slope to calve. And uh, calves are incredibly important prey for wolves in spring and early summer, as well as grizzly bears. Studies have shown that up until a, a, a um, calf caribou is about two weeks of age, it's very vulnerable to uh, wolves. And then after two weeks of age, it can outrun a wolf. And it is very vulnerable to a grizzly bear until it's about 10 years of age, 10 days of age, excuse me, and then it's able to outrun a grizzly bear. The wolf crossed all of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in just a few days. There were no animals there. He went through the heart of what's normally the main calving area, and there were no caribou for him to feed on. So he ended up over here in, in, the, in the east side of the Canning River. This is the Canning River here, the, which is the western boundary of the, of the uh, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And he spent several weeks in this area. Uh, and it was thought that he was likely 
there and concentrated there because there's another herd of caribou, the, the central Arctic herd that calves in that area. And there's not many wolves on the North Slope. And so likely he was able to stay there without any competition from other wolves. But again, it was still wintry and he was having a hard time uh, finding food. Ptarmigan were one thing. The, the hills were beginning to go snow free. The caribou trails that had been etched over eons were free of animals. And he had a hard time finding food. The one animal he saw quite a few of was uh, the Arctic fox. Um, these animals are uh, fairly common on the north slope of Alaska and on the western slope or, or western coast of Alaska. But they run a particular risk for wolves. Wolves are very um, uh, unwelcoming to foxes, let's put it that way. They, they, they see them as competitors, I suppose, in some way, even though they only weigh eight or nine pounds, but they will kill an Arctic fox if they should run into one. But the risk for a wolf is these animals on the north slope of Alaska and western Alaska are the reservoir of rabies. And there have been outbreaks of rabies in wolves and uh, rabid wolves have attacked or approached people in the past in Alaska and a couple of rab rabid wolves the year after the wanderer uh, was in the Brooks Rage uh, were killed that had rabies and had attacked a dog. So he ran a risk from these little animals because of the chance of, of contracting rabies. One of the little critters that he fed upon beside, when he couldn't find caribou were Arctic ground squirrels. Others were lemmings of various kinds, and of course, birds and bird nests. And wolves are very, very adept at getting ground squirrels. It was kind of amazing to watch one big one out of the ground. I once saw a, a wolf catch eight ground squirrels uh, in a day, and that's 16 pounds of meat that it can consume when there's not much else left for it. And another prey species they would encounter on the North Slope, a wolf would encounter on the North Slope, are uh, musk oxen. And at that time of year, the wanderers showed up there uh, that had their calves. Perfect size critter for a wolf to feed upon, catch and bring down, except that the musk ox formed defensive lines and circles to protect their, their, their young specifically from wolves and other large predators. And so he wasn't doing very good in the realm of catching a large prey species, but he was making his own, again, probably by feeding on calf caribou. But as the summer wore on, those calves were getting bigger and more difficult to catch. And it was, it was likely certain there were a number of days when he was going hungry. They call it the land of the midnight sun because on the longest day of the year, the sun never sets before it starts back up again. And the growth is phenomenal. The one thing that's the most impressive about his movements, and if you've ever driven the Dalton Highway, the one road in Alaska that goes all the way to the Arctic Ocean, you're, you, you have to be impressed by the immense landscape, how big it is, and how a wolf can find prey in all that landscape is, you, you know, pretty astounding just to see the territory you have to cover every day. And it's not easy country. There's tussocks, uh, swamp, uh, a muskeg, permafrost, ponds. It's very difficult country for any animal, even a wolf, who can uh, be injured just by traversing the terrain. I mentioned earlier that there are very few wolves on the North Slope itself. There are wolf dens in the north side of the Brooks Range up in the mountains, but on the plain, the, uh, in the Arctic Refuge, on that plain, there are no wolf dens and none have ever been found. And it's probably because of permafrost. It's, it's just not conducive to having uh, um, a viable den. 
And then the other factor is, of course, that there isn't year-round prey that would support a pack of wolves. Uh, most wolves that come out onto the plain, they come out of the mountains to hunt caribou and muskox and go back into the mountains uh, in the wintertime. And of course, the, the wolves can have uh, a number of young, up to about eight or typical litter size. And uh, they, these pups need to be fed consistently and constantly because they grow quickly and the mortality is very high for young pups. Autumn comes very early in the high Arctic, uh, as early as uh, the second week in August, the fall colors come on, the caribou begin to migrate to the south side of the Brooks Range, and there's not gonna be a lot left up there for a wolf to feed on. And the trails are fairly obvious that, that the caribou used to go to the south side of the Brooks Range. Competitor of a wolf for what prey is left on the north side are grizzly bears. And of course, muskox have matured. And in the fall, uh, when the running season is on, they're very formidable, dangerous animals. A bull, a muskox will attack almost anything. Be, people have even seen them attacking birds that had the temerity to enter their field of vision because they're very feisty and very protective and uh, way too formidable for a, a lone wolf or even a pack of wolves. So the wanderer spent most of the summer in this area along the Dalton Highway, uh, south of east of Prudhoe Bay, outside of the refuge. This is the refuge boundary, the Canning River. And it led John Birch, the biologist who colored him, to believe that the wolf had paired up. He thought that perhaps he localized to this area because he had paired up and he had found another uh, wolf. And John thought that that would be the reason. Uh, another biologist thinks that the reason he stayed there was likely just because of the availability of food. Again, this is the calming grounds and uh, summer feeding grounds of part of the Central Arctic caribou herd. So anyway, he started south through the Brooks Range. This is the Sheenjek River where Marty Murray and Olas Murray conceived the notion of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Then on to the south side of the Brooks Range where fall was coming on. And winter was very, very close at hand. And one of the animals that the wanderer had been feeding upon, the Arctic ground squirrel was quickly becoming unavailable to him because these animals migrate, or migrate hibernate uh, for long months at a time. And the only ones left above ground were the males and the females and the young were already in hibernation by the time the wanderer left the North Slope. Dull sheep were a prey species he might be able to find in the Brooks Range, but they're few and far between. He came onto the south side into the Chandelar drainage. This is this area over here, the Chandelar River. The vast caribou herds that had come down from the north were over way over in this area. And his journey was taking him this way, away from the caribou. Kept going south parallel to the Dalton Highway, never coming very close to it, heading towards the Yukon River the Jim River. And once again, he was in moose country. He had been out of moose country for quite a long time. Uh, his natal territory was moose country, moose habitat, and he was used to feeding on moose with, the, with his running mate. And here he was in the Kayakuk region that was really good moose habitat. But again, a moose is a formidable animal for a lone wolf, and there was no indication he um, 
uh, might have approached Saab, but he, he never ha was able to bring one down. His only luck would have been if he would have found carrion or, or, or animal injured some way in the rut that comes on in September. He ended up in the Hadzana Hills. And how he ended up here was pretty astounding because when he left the Brooks Range and was going south, he could have gone east, he could have gone west, he could have gone a number of directions. But some way, somehow, he ended up in the Hadzana Hills, which has a non-migratory resident caribou herd. It's very small and non-migratory. In some way or other, he ended up where this herd was, and it was his one chance now remaining for survival because these were animals he could likely catch. They, a caribou can be brought down by a lone wolf, and it was the rutting season coming on for caribou and he might be able to find a caribou that was weakened in some way and he could maybe bring one down and and how of all the directions he could have come he ended up where these caribou were uh is still a mystery it's right near finger mountain a prominent uh, landmark on the uh dalton highway it, the this is the hudsona hill these are the hudsona hills on this map and you can see his progressions here. And then uh, this is all his last known um, position. Um, he, he ended up along the Canudi River. And um, there was a mortality signal received on the download from the satellite transmitter. And it appeared that he was no longer moving. Uh, he was just about a mile from the highway. The, the area where he, these are the huds of the hills. Hit, his remains were found right over here. And this is just within just a couple days of um, that signal. It went from fall to winter. And his remains were found under a tree. No sign of any predation or wounds of any kind. When he was found, he weighed exactly 61 pounds. When he started his travel, he weighed 102 pounds. And the amazing thing of this is that Northeast corner of Alaska that he had traveled through uh, supports hundreds of thousands of moose, tens of thousands of moose, thousands of doll sheep, countless small mammals. And yet this wolf traveling through some of the true wilderness areas of Alaska, hardly developed, um, could not make a living. It's it's pretty astounding to think that 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 with all of that availability of land, with all those animals, that a wolf couldn't survive. And it's just so indicative of the difficulty of of existence that wolves face in the far north, trying to make a living, especially a lone wolf. A pack has a much more powerful uh, impact on the prey species, and a wolf has a very difficult time making a go of it. Thank you so much, Tom. That was wonderful. We really appreciate it. Learned so much, too. Um, so before we get into questions, I want to just do a quick five minutes about wolves in Oregon. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and then we'll get into the Q&A. So thanks so much. Great, so again, I'm the Wildlife Program Manager for Oregon Wild. And um, yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to 
uh, as as a state based organization working to protect and restore Oregon's wildlife, I just wanted to um, take a moment to talk about wolves in Oregon. I think I am anyway. Let's see. Oh, sorry, went too fast. There we go. So, um, like Tom mentioned, for Alaska and, and much of America and Canada, wolves are a native species uh, to Oregon. They're a keystone species, um, and were really once incredibly in abundant um, and, and here for for many years um, before their their extirpation. And you know, similar goes the story of the rest of America and, and wolf populations, but there was obviously a very deliberate and explicit um, you know, intent to, to essentially eradicate the, the animal from the landscape. And so by 1947, um, wolves were all but locally extinct, otherwise known as extirpated. Um, and so there was a good 50 years where we haven't, we didn't have wolves on the landscape. And, you know, similar to observations in Yellowstone and the rest of the country, you know, when you do remove a keystone species from that landscape, uh, you start, start to see how uh, the ecosystem function, the, the species and the environment around that animal um, aren't functioning at the highest level that they should be. Um, and so, you know, as we know that wolves were eventually reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park and to central Idaho. Uh, and then from Idaho, they dispersed, started to naturally disperse back to Oregon. And it's that's one thing I think that's always important to clarify. Um, I hear it a lot from, from different lawmakers and other decision makers, this idea that wolves were um, specifically and actively reintroduced in Oregon, um, where they weren't, they they just dispersed back from uh, over from Idaho, and so the first confirmed sighting uh, was in 1999 with B300. We promptly put her in a helicopter and sent her back over the border, um, which is obviously not a strategy going forward. And so, um, you know, wolves started to trickle in, and there were some sightings here and there, and really weren't. I would say here in earnest till about 2005, uh, probably just before that, where packs were actually starting to uh, to be established within Oregon's borders. And so, um, you know, knowing that they needed a better approach to wolf recovery and management, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, adopted a wolf plan in 2005, and and that's been the document and and the 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 policy that, you know, that guides wolf management decisions in, in Oregon. So there's a really quick snapshot. There's a lot of things in between all of that, but I just wanted, you know, to provide that foundational basis about, about wolves in Oregon. Um, just for the interest of time, I'm not going to kind of go into all this stuff on this coexistence that I have, but uh, if you want to learn more, I'm happy to talk to you. You can always email me and, and I will happily talk more about wolves and, and coexistence in Oregon. But one of the things I did really want to touch base on, because it did come out um, just last month, is our annual wolf report, which uh, documents, you know, a minimum known wolf population in Oregon. It, you know, obviously looks at breeding pairs, packs, just kind of a, a, a snapshot of how wolves are doing in the state. And so that came out last month. And uh, unfortunately, the population only went up by three known uh, wolves, confirmed wolves. So last year, the, the population count was at 175. And this year, they confirmed 178. And that is a minimum count. It's always a minimum count. Um, and, you know, so who knows if there are more, more wolves out there, but for, you know, comparing apples to apple, apples year of excuse me, year after year, um, you know, we're somewhere in the ballpark of 178. Breeding pairs went up by one. However, you know, the year before, I believe they had gone by, gone down by two. So somewhat of a leveling off. Uh, some good news, we did see some wolves dispersing further into Western Oregon, which is really great uh, because, you know, it's important that they move out of being clustered in Northeastern Oregon and, and disperse into new habitat. Um, so that was good to see. But ultimately, the thing that I, I think is really front and center, especially for Oregon Wild, is just how much mortality is, is human caused um, in Oregon. And so, you know, of the 20 known mortalities last year, 17 were human caused. Um, seven were poached. Six were either killed by ODFW or rubber stamped for somebody else to kill the wolves. 
we have two that were struck by vehicles and then two that were shot. Um, I think one was caught in the act and one, to be fair, was a questionable <laughs> whether or not that was actually a poaching. I think it was sort of a retroactive applied, hey, I didn't know it was a wolf situation. But regardless, with such a small increase in the wolf population coupled with really high mortality, you know, we can see where some of that disconnect is. And so I have up there the growth rates. These are the growth rates um, since wolves were removed from the state endangered species list. And these are quite honestly well below ODFW's own estimates about where they thought that growth rate would be. And so um, it's troubling to us. And, you know, we, as we head into the next iteration of the wolf plan, which is coming up pretty soon, you know, we want to be doing everything we can to find solutions that work for coexistence that actually reduce predation, but of course, ultimately support recovery of wolves across Oregon. Um, finally, and this is my last slide, you know, one of the things that has happened recently is restored protections for wolves in Western Oregon. This was um, reinstated after a Trump delisting rule. So that's great. Um, and, you know, we have also worked with partners to launch an anti-poaching reward fund to try to incentivize people to turn in poachers. Um, wolf poaching is so high and it really remains a problem. And then, like I said, the final thing for forward looking, and you're gonna hear from me if you're on our email list, um, is just this next review and update of the wolf conservation plan. Again, as this drives all management, just about all management decisions in the state. So it matters a lot. And uh, we wanna continue to make sure that we are using the best available science to, to drive these decisions. So with that, we will get to questions and answers. Thank you uh, for, bearing with me to learn a little bit about what's going on with wolves specifically in Oregon. So Tom, let's see, I have a couple questions. I got a couple for you just related to how did you first become interested in writing The Wanderer? Like what drew you to this story? It, it, it was the uh, movement, the distance traveled. <clears throat> I've been very lucky over the years to see a lot of unique wildlife uh, behaviors. And for a few years, I followed around maritime wolves out on the coast and was able to watch their, their interesting um, inter, uh, interactions with other species and while hunting. But when I heard about this movement, you know, I, I'd heard that wolves will move 500 miles in a, you know, when they disperse and whatnot. But, you know, to go uh, a measured, and this is again, point to point, a measured 2,100 miles which uh, through a formula uh, becomes 2,900 miles while dispersing, that's, that's amazing to me. That, that amazed me. And it was that uh, a movement that drew me to the story. Great, yeah. And that is quite a ways to go, <laughs> to go yeah. it from, like you said, from point to point. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. I, somebody wanted to know, was there anything you learned while researching um, uh, Wolf 258 that just really surprised you? Just something that maybe you didn't expect in your research? Well, I, th I think, again, behavior. I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm an old style naturalist who likes to learn by ob observation. And the, there, there was, I, I showed in a slideshow, Biederman Bluff above the Yukon, the bend in the Yukon, and I failed to mention earlier that when uh, 258 left Yukon Charlie, he crossed the Yukon River a mile of that river during breakup with this tremendous ice flow slamming down the river. Then when he got on to the other side of the river, he climbed Biederman Bluff, which is a thousand feet high, and then dropped down the, up overnight into the Candic before heading north. And what 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 astounded me was that he crossed both the Yukon and the Porcupine River, which is another huge river, during the peak of breakup. And and people have seen uh, seen uh, caribou smashed in those uh, ice flows and drowned in that river. And to think that a wolf, a hundred pound wolf, could swim that and negotiate those rivers, that was pretty astounding. Impressive, indeed. 
let's see. Somebody wanted to know how old can a wild wolf be? Um, and some additional context. I think they were, it was from somebody's grandson, curious to know what the average age of collared wolves in the wild are, or just a best guess of their lifespan. Well, I think uh, the, the consensus of the biologists I talked to was a wolf over eight years of age is an old wolf. Mm -hmm. Yep. I feel, I have heard the same. So <laughs> if it's older than that, it's a pretty impressively old wild wolf. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, one person, I think this came, this question came up when you were obviously on a slide relevant to this, but it says, why do you think he didn't follow the caribou herds? There are multiple times when the wanderer seems to go in the opposite direction. Why would that be competition well, from other wolves or something else? That's, a, you know, a lot of it is supposition because of course you get the locations and you can, you can ascertain certain information from that. Like if he's in one place for two or three days, you know, he's feeding on something. And likely if it's in the, on the tundra, it's a caribou. If it's in the forest, it's a moose. You can ascertain certain things like that, but there's some things you just don't know. But when the caribou were coalescing on the upper Firth River near the Arctic coast, and he went all the way through the herd and ended up way over by the Mackenzie River and came back. And then they didn't linger very long. They're in the heart of the herd at calving time when there was prey everywhere. It would have been like being in a grocery store. Oh boy, I'll eat this calf. And there's another one. And it was probably the one time when he was doing really well and suddenly he leaves. The only explanation is competition from other wolves. Because the Canadians identify two different kinds of wolves. They identify taiga wolves, which mean forest wolves that are sedentary and have their territories. And then they call the other type tundra wolves, which migrate and follow the herds of caribou. So he wasn't a, alone around that coalescing herd of caribou. And likely he abandoned that area because of competition from other wolves and the risk from those wolves. Gotcha. Thank you. Well, and there are sea wolves as well. <laughs> Not that that was yeah, a, a great uh, documentary on Netflix if y'all haven't seen it. But um, uh, somebody wants to know, and I don't know if you said this. Did, did they know how old he was? When yeah, he was three years old when he when he when he uh, he was a two year old, and he made it to three. Okay. What can we take away from the wanderer's journey about wolves as a whole or on a population level? Wow, that's a great question. Well, I think uh, uh, on the, on the, as a population and the reason why you see wolves in places in Oregon and places in California and they're starting to show up in places they've never been before, it's a natural behavior for them to disperse. They, there are established territories and the young animals to have a chance to breed or to survive. They move off in search of their home territory, their own territories and their own mates. And so it's predictable that you're gonna see expansion of, of wolf populations. And I think on another, another level, or what you can take away from this story is, um, this wolf traveled through wilderness that would be, be beyond a person's normal understanding of what wilderness is. It, it's a vast, vast territory he traveled through. And really to have wolves, you have to have wilderness. You have to have miles and miles of undeveloped country uh, he never came closer than one mile from a road, and that was the the, the day he died. And um, there was a biologist in Alaska, a really brilliant man by the name of Bob Whedon, and he once said, um, the world needs the, embody the embodiment of the frontier mythology. It needs a place where wolves stalk the strand lines in the dark, because a land that can produce a wolf is a robust, healthy, and perfect land. Wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> I know I was thinking too, you know, we're seeing in Oregon to that point of 
of wolves dispersing and and the need needing wilderness and needing these protected areas so that they can get from one place to another and and some of the reason we're seeing such an uptick in vehicle strikes is exactly that they're having to cross major roads and highways to get out of the northeast cluster where you know they're they are that is where the majority of the population is and they're trying to get out to go other places and when they do you know they're either getting killed by a poacher or you know running into conflict or being hit by a vehicle so it is it's important to underscore that need for at least especially in places that have a lot of you know urban populations and cities that that connectivity between wilderness in addition to the actual um land itself for once they get there um but yeah that's that's important. So I'm going to do maybe two more questions. We're a few minutes over. We sometimes do this when we have a lot of great questions going. Um, I actually have a question. Let's see. Oh, because I mentioned that um, uh, wolves in the population getting bigger in Western Oregon, and they wanted to know if that follows the same boundary as the federal listing and delisting. So in Oregon, um, we have our our protection split and so the eastern third of our state is federally delisted and then the western two-thirds are federally listed and so um so no that does not follow the same line um to answer that person's question it's a different it's a different management boundary there's sort of the federal and then there's a state management boundary so those are different okay let's see Oh, I don't know if you know this, Tom, and I don't know if I know the answer on Journey's end of it to compare, but somebody wanted to know how does the Wanderer's mileage that they that he covered compared to OR7, the famous Journey wolf in Oregon that dispersed from Northeastern not, Oregon yeah. and was the first in California. Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't know that. I don't know how it does. I and I know one of my colleagues is in is on listening in, and she probably knows. I mean, I think Journey covered well over a thousand, but I I'm thinking that's going to still be much shyer uh, than Wanderer. So is my best guess without knowing specific mileage here. Um, ooh, okay. Let's end with this one. What interactions occur between wolves and coyotes in Alaska? That's an interesting question, but uh, you know, I, I will say that if, if if some of your your viewers and listeners may have been to Yellowstone, and be, prior to the reintroduction of uh, wolves to Yellowstone, there was a, a, a huge number of coyotes, and so the wolf populations were reintroduced, they is reestablished, and the number of coyotes went downhill. And consequently, the number of red fox went uphill. So that when there are fewer coyotes, there are fewer red fox or more red foxes. And then when there are fewer wolves, there's more coyotes. The same is pretty much uh, in Alaska. Uh, in the probably up until about 1980 or so, there were no wolves on the Kenai Peninsula, for example, that had been largely extirpated. And then they started to naturally come in to the Kenai, move back into the Kenai, and the robust population of coyotes there went markedly downhill. Here in Denali, uh, wolf populations have been decreased over the years. Coyote populations have increased, and the number of red foxes have decreased. Those canine predators, even though they're different sizes and um, uh, may have a little slightly different prey base, they're not very tolerant of, of uh, competitors that are canines. Well, thank you. And I'm sure we could ask you questions until tomorrow, but we will be mindful of everyone's time and just thank you again so much for sharing this wonderful story of the Wanderer. And uh, yeah, a recording will be sent out, folks, um, and will be posted on our website. And thanks again, and uh, stay tuned for our next webcast. So thank you again, Tom. Well, you're most welcome, and thank you for, for asking me. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.